The title of this video represents a play on the Chinese Communist Party's description of its economy. Several decades ago, when China's growing reliance on the for-profit sectors of its economy could no longer be credibly denied by the CCP, its leadership approved the slogan, Socialism with Chinese Characteristics, to describe the Chinese economic system. Formulated by Deng Xiaoping, the phrase became an essential component the CCP's attempt to rationalize Chinese capitalist development under a socialist communist political system. According to the party, the growing privatization of the Chinese economy was to be a temporary phase, lasting as long as a hundred years according to some party leaders, on the way to a classless society of full socialism communism. The party leaders claimed, and still maintain, that socialism with Chinese characteristics was necessary in China's case because China was a backward, agrarian country when communism was introduced, too early, it was suggested. China needed a capitalist booster shot. With the slogan, the party was able to argue that China had been an exception to the orthodox Marxist position that socialism arrives only after the development of capitalism, although Marx himself deviated from his own formula late in life. At the same time, the slogan allowed the CCP to confirm the orthodox Marxist position. China's communist revolution had come before developed industrial capitalism, an exception to orthodox Marxism. Capitalism was thus introduced into China's economic system later, a confirmation of orthodox Marxism. Stripped of its socialist ideological pretensions, socialism with Chinese characteristics, or the Chinese system itself, amounts to a socialist communist state increasingly funded by capitalist economic development. The difference between the former Soviet Union and contemporary China is that when it became obvious that a socialist communist economy had failed, the former gave up its socialist communist economic pretenses, while the latter did not. Whether the CCP leaders believe their own rhetoric or not, the ideological gymnastics on display are nevertheless spectacular. On its face, the slogan embeds and glosses over a seemingly obvious contradiction in an attempt to sanctify or recommunize Chinese capitalist development as a precondition of full socialism communism. However, the Chinese slogan does capture an essential truth about communism, one that is either unrecognized or unacknowledged by the CCP and denied by Western Marxists. Contrary to the assertions of communist leaders and followers, and even contrary to the claims of many who oppose it, socialism communism is not essentially an economic but rather a political system. Once in power, socialist communist leaders recognize that given their control over resources, they have effectively become the new owners of the means of production, whereas, as Ludwig von Mises suggested, consumers effectively hold the power of economic disposal in free markets. In attempting to implement a socialist communist economy, they recognize that, in the absence of prices, large-scale industrial production requires supervisory decision-making. Likewise, decision-making is not democratic in the sense promised by socialist communist ideologues. Decision-making must be centralized, or at least bureaucratized, to a great extent. Democratic decision-making is precluded by state-owned and controlled production and distribution. Socialism communism is a political system in which resource allocation is commanded by the state and thus effectively controlled by the state leaders, the real ruling class. The latter retain control through ideology and force. As opposed to a fully implemented economic system, socialism communism is always only a political arrangement. This is why socialism communism can be combined with capitalism under such forms as state capitalism or corporate socialism. Its economic pretensions will be jettisoned as capitalist development is introduced and cleverly rationalized, as in China. If such pretensions are maintained for long, they will wreck society, as in the former Soviet Union. In either case, the socialist communist leadership will learn that wealth production requires the accumulation of privately held capital, whether they understand why or not. Enter corporate socialism. A socialist communist sequel is coming to a theater near you. Some of the same old characters are reappearing, while new ones have joined the cast. While the ideology and rhetoric sound nearly the same, they are being put to slightly different ends. This time around, the old bromides and promises are in play, and a similar but not identical bait and switch is being dangled. Socialism promises the protection of the beleaguered from the economically and politically evil, 
the promotion of the economic interests of the underclass, a benign banning of dangerous persons from public forums and civic life, and a primary or exclusive concern for the common good. China's One Belt, One Road initiative the 4th of May hang the takers in Africa and other underdeveloped regions as if from an infrastructural noose. A different variety is on the docket in the developed world, including in the U.S. The contemporary variant is corporate socialism, or a two-tiered system of actually existing socialism, five on the ground, coupled with a parallel set of corporate monopolies or would-be monopolies on top. The difference between state socialism and corporate socialism is merely that a different constituency effectively controls the means of production. But both depend on monopoly, one the state and the other the corporate monopolization of the economy. And both depend on socialist communist ideology of democratic socialism, or, in a recent variant, social justice, or, woke, ideology. Corporate socialism is the desired end, while democratic socialism and woke capitalism are among the means. China is the model for the economic and political system being promoted in the West, and the Great Reset is the most forthright articulation of that system, although its articulation is anything but perfectly forthright. The Great Reset represents the development of the Chinese system in the West, only in reverse. Whereas the Chinese political elite began with a socialist-communist political system and implemented capitalism, later, the elite in the West began with capitalism and is aiming to implement a socialist-communist political system now. It's as if the Western oligarchy looked to the socialism on display in China and said, yes, we want it. This explains many otherwise seeming contradictions, not the least of which is the leftist authoritarianism of big tech. Big tech, and in particular big digital, is the ideological communications apparatus for the advancement of corporate socialism, or capitalism with Chinese characteristics. The Chinese characteristics that the Great Reset aims to reproduce in connection with Western capitalism would resemble the totalitarianism of the CCP. It would require a great abridgment of individual rights, including property rights, free expression, freedom of movement, freedom of association, freedom of religion, and the free enterprise system as we understand it. The Great Reset would implement the political system in much the same way as China has done, with 5G-enabled smart city surveillance, the equivalent of social credit scores, medical passports, political imprisonment, and other means of social and political repression and control. In the end, socialism with Chinese characteristics and capitalism with Chinese characteristics would amount to the same thing. China's secret of success is also based above all on its access to global goods and factor markets and thus to economies that have comparatively freer markets for means of production and consumer goods. In this way, Chinese planners learn which goods have which market prices, and this gives them guidance for their own planning. Without the information on the world market prices of goods, the Chinese planning offices would be flying blind. Add to this the access to capital, technology, know-how and management techniques from abroad that Chinese have acquired, through investments by foreign companies in China, but also through industrial espionage, cyber attacks, and theft of intellectual property. This is quite crucial for China to catch up economically and even get on the fast track. Like any socialist planned economy authoritarian regime, China has a drive for expansion, it strives for world domination. Unfortunately, the communist leadership in China has an easy game with this, because it is not met with categorical resistance from the Western world, because it is increasingly turning away from capitalism and falling for socialism or communism. There is much to suggest that there will be a rude awakening, as freedom and prosperity around the world will fall by the wayside. The Chinese model will also fail. So far, it has benefited from the even freer economies. However, as these economies become more and more interventionist, this source of China's success will dry up and the coming global economic crisis will hit China very hard. The thing about capitalism it would seem is that it requires considerable freedom to work. The entrepreneur must be free to capitalize on what Israel Kirzner calls pure profit opportunities, he sees that potatoes are selling for five at the bottom of the hill and for ten at the top. He borrows capital from the capitalist to buy potatoes, get them carted up the hill, and sell them for profit less transportation and capital costs. Now a capitalist society is just a million such entrepreneurs, or ten million, or one hundred million all ceaselessly in search of such profit opportunity. Now if we accept Foucault's conception of power's effects as primarily productive rather than repressive then, 
And as Foucault put it, a fundamental effect of capitalism is that it produces a capitalist mentality, then capitalism tends to produce the individual, the free subject, the subject who understands himself in libertarian terms. For the Marxist this can only mean capitalism produces in the individual a false identity, an identity which, alienates, him from his true identity of a worker in solidarity with all other workers. The production of this capitalist mentality with its necessary component of preference for freedom, the freedom to act in a market and the preference for that market to itself be free, poses considerable danger to a ruling political class. As Foucault frequently points out the great fear of all political classes as rebellion and nothing cultivates a taste for freedom from political subjugation quite like operating as an entrepreneur. Perhaps this then is an additional reason for the preference of a political ruling class for state capitalism capitalist socialism. One seeks the productive benefits of capitalism while remaining ever suspicious of its side effects, its pernicious effect of constituting the free subject, the individual understanding himself as free to pursue his own aims, the individual who wants freedom both for himself and for everyone else. A ruling political class therefore, while seeking to maximize capitalist productivity and accumulation of capital, must simultaneously deploy safeguards serving to minimize the production and accumulation of capitalists themselves. State capitalism functions as a defense against the individual capitalist, forming an unholy alliance between the large corporation and the ruling political class. The one gets protection against competitors, the other gets protection against rebellion. This was the nomad economist. Please like, share, leave me a comment, subscribe, and please take some time to subscribe to my backup channels, I do upload videos there too. You'll find the links in the description box. You will also find a PayPal link if you want to make a donation. Thank you wholeheartedly to all those of you who have already donated. Stay safe and healthy friends.